Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out here tonight for the 13th annual Free Speech Week celebration. Um, this is, uh, I think, an important week for students at Florida Tech. Uh, and I'll tell you how this started. 13 years ago, I was uh, pretty new in my role as advisor to the student newspaper. And I finally got around to reading the Student Media Board Constitution. Probably should have done that on day one, maybe regret that a little bit, but I found an interesting passage in there. And it said, freedom of the press, as guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States, is not blocked or interfered with by Florida Tech or any of its trustees, administrators, faculty, or staff. I thought that's an interesting sentence. We've revised that a little bit because it, it actually the, the gr grammar of it is a little clunky because the Constitution doesn't actually come to play. So we've cleaned up that language and we've got a statement in, our, in, in the Florida Tech Principles and Philosophies for Panther Media Group that says student media leaders are given responsibility for making independent editorial choices and exercising their judgment in determining content and delivery decisions and seeing the results of such decisions. So this is important. And what this means is that the things you read in the Crimson on our website uh, and the Student Media Panther Radio, uh, the stuff that they produce, WFIT, the Kaleidoscope, those are decisions that are made by the student body. They're in there because, or the, the student editors, they're in there because they think the students will be interested in them. And it's stuff that's not in, in there is because they decided not to include it. These are decisions that they make. So we're here to celebrate that. When I read that statement, I thought, man, I gotta make sure my students know about this. And then I thought, I gotta make sure that the administration is reminded of how important, of that promise that they've made. Um, and so we celebrate this week in honor of that, and also in honor of all the work that important journalists do throughout our, our, our country and throughout the globe. Um, and one of the things that we've tried to do with this event is provide voice to the voiceless, right? To, to highlight the journalists that are, that are voicing the concerns of those who are, are hard to hear from. And it started out with our very first keynote speaker was from the Medill Justice Project, um, talking about people who, who they thought were potentially wrongfully convicted, and they reinvestigated those. Talk about voiceless, right? Um, we've had people talk about mental health institutions in Florida. Talk about voiceless. Um, rape and sexual, assault, and sexual assault survivors. We had someone who, who focused on prison conditions. And our last keynote speaker focused on the border uh, and, the, and the issues that are facing migrants in and, and, um, and, and southern Texas. So we've done our best. And our, our, key speaker, our keynote speaker today, James Edwards, follows in that tradition. His, work, uh, his, his podcast series, Unresolved, examines the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act of 2007. Um, this law created a list of names, mostly black men, women, and children who were killed decades ago. Their cases gone cold. In the podcast, James examines a few of those cases and how justice plays out. Uh, Edwards is a, uh, has held a variety of producing, reporting, and digital positions at public media outlets such as WBEZ Chicago, Public Radio International, um, WGBH News in Boston, um, and the news magazine Need to Know on PBS. He has worked as a researcher on several film, TV, and documentary projects, including the feature film Candyman and the HBO series Lovecraft Country. Please join me in welcoming James Edwards. Thank you, thank you Ted, and thank you, Florida Tech. Uh, no, this is indeed an honor, and we're so happy to be here to talk about Unresolved. Uh, before I begin, uh, I know everybody probably hasn't had a chance to listen to the podcast. I wanted to just play the trailer for the entire project because Unresolved is more than a podcast. It's a podcast, a documentary film, an interactive, an art installation, and an education curriculum. Uh, so presenting Unresolved. This is the story of lives cut short, of families seeking justice, and the limits and failures of a federal effort to right wrongs in the country's past. on the door, she opened up the door. They said that we investigated your husband's 
death concerning the shooting with Officer Kelly and handed her the letter, and that's when she broke down. The Justice Department uh, under the Emmett Till law has taken up the case. I'm sure that they will do the best they can do under the circumstances. The thing of it is, is that this man has lived out his life. Jimmy did not live out his life. All his life is gone. Alberta went out of the house a healthy woman and got abducted and beat to death and then thrown away like she was a bag of trash. And nobody has ever been tried for it. If people forget who we are as they have in the past, we'll remind you because we are going to be here. We're always going to be here for whatever that's worth. It's a story that is familiar to people of color all over this country. He remains. That is unresolved. Um, before I begin, I just want to give a heads up that you know, some of the cases that I'll talk about uh, just include through some graphic details, but it's just a history that needs telling. Um, you know, unresolved is why I got into journalism. You know, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, surrounded by history. I could never get enough of it. Just two blocks down the street from where my family and I lived was the home of Mahalia Jackson, the queen of gospel. My mom loves telling stories of Miss Jackson scolding kids to stop running on her lawn after they got out of school. And not too far away lived future Hall of Famer and Mr. Cub Ernie Banks, the first, the first black ball player for the Chicago Cubs. And every morning riding the 111-115 bus to high school, I'd pass the Pullman District, the site of the 1894 Pullman strike, one of the seminal moments in this country's labor history. Labor Day became a federal holiday in large part because of it. Even my barber shop, I'd come to find out, had been co-owned for years by the husband of Mamie Till Mobley, Emmett Till's mother. History was everywhere, but I always didn't know that. There was only so much history I learned in, learned in school. Sadly, Chicago's history wa wasn't much of it. In my history classes, we were lucky to get anywhere past Vietnam and Watergate by the end of the school year. But if there's one piece of my hometown's history I wish I'd learned sooner, it's the story behind another building I'd pass all the time, whether riding the bus or riding in the car with my family. I passed this place hundreds, maybe even thousands of times. At one point, my mom and I lived in an apartment across the street. By then, it was just another building home to one of the city's community service centers. Yet from the outside, it was easy to see that long before being a community center, this was a police station. In college, through the work of an extraordinary journalist, I finally learned that this wasn't just any police station. This was the police station of Commander John Burge and the Midnight Crew, responsible for one of the darkest chapters in Chicago's history. During the 1970s and 1980s, Burge, along with officers under him, in the words of The Guardian, quote, either directly participated in or implicitly approved the torture of at least 118 people in police custody, most of them black men. Their methods included beating, suffocation, burning, and electric shock. Burge was fired in 1992, but it'd be another 16 years before he faced any justice for what he'd done. By then, justice had its limits. The statute of limitations had run out for any charges tied directly to the torture. So all federal prosecutors could charge was obstruction of justice and perjury in connection to one of the many civil lawsuits filed, by, filed by, against Burge by his victims. No other officers alleged to be involved came close to that. Part of me felt shame for not knowing this history sooner. How could I be so close 
yet so far from the truth of the horrors that happened inside that building. How many other people from the neighborhood were there who didn't know, who just rode by or walked past day after day? These were the questions that led me into a career in journalism, to shine a light on buried histories and uncomfortable truths and make it easier for kids like me searching for more than what they were being taught. Unresolved is another, even larger story of buried histories and un uncomfortable truths. Drawn on more than two years of reporting, thousands of documents, and dozens of firsthand interviews with family members, as well as current and former Justice Department and FBI officials, state and local law enforcement, lawmakers, civil rights leaders, and investigative journalists, Unresolved investigates the federal government's effort to grapple with more than 150 civil rights era killings through the Emmett Till Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act. Among the victims, voting rights advocates, veterans, Louisville's first female prosecutor, business owners, mothers, fathers, and children, 18 children. For the first time, all 150 plus names on the Till Act list were gathered and collected in a comprehensive database and web, web interactive about their lives their deaths, and their families' quest for justice. The cases on the Till Act list are not only the unresolved killings that took place during the Civil Rights era, just the ones the Department of Justice has re-examined. At the heart of the project has been a drive to center the voices of the families of those on the list. So Frontline partnered with StoryCorps to record nearly two dozen oral histories with victims next of kin. These oral histories will be archived in the Library of Congress. And it goes without saying that unresolved would not have been possible without the past and current efforts of universities like LSU, Syracuse, Syracuse School of Law, Northeastern University School of Law, which was one of our partners on this project, and civil rights groups like the NAACP and Southern Poverty Law Center, and the, pr the press, particularly the black press. We stand on their shoulders in doing this work. A significant number of cases on the Till Act list were referred to the government by these universities and groups. Now, what did we find? For starters, since the Till Act became law in 2008, the FBI and Justice Department have made no new arrests and brought no new federal prosecutions. The only prosecution that did happen with some federal assistance occurred at the state level, but more on that case later. When the Till Act passed in 2008, more than 100 cases were initially re-examined. But in less than two years, more than half were closed again. At least 66 cases on the Till Act list were closed because all suspects were dead. But the list also included, but the list also includes at least 23 victims whose cases were closed while a possible suspect was still living. Almost a third of the killings on the list involved law enforcement. It's around 50. And one of those included FBI agents. Neither the FBI nor the Department of Justice would say how many agents or prosecutors have been assigned to the cold case effort. But later on in a statement to us, the DOJ said it was in the process of adding three attorneys to work on cold case matters, as well as a dedicated investigator. The killings on the, on the, Till, Act list, on, on the Till Act list took place as far south as the Mississippi Delta and as far north as the Canadian border. The 56 incidents Mississippi is the most represented state, followed by Georgia. Some states, including Maine, New York, Utah, and Washington State, had one incident apiece on the list. Here in Florida, there were six. There was Jesse Cano, a reported unionizer and rock miner of Mexican descent, who was reportedly attempting to help unionize miners and was blackballed in the mining community. He went missing at some point in 1965 and has never been found. And there's Johnny Mae Chappelle, a black mother of 10 and house cleaner who walked to the store to buy ice cream for her children. Along the way, she lost her wallet. Chappelle was retracing her steps with two neighbors when they heard a loud pop as a dark sedan sped past. Chappelle clutched her right side and said, I've been shot, and fell to the ground. She died before reaching the hospital. Harry and Harriet Moore. The Moores educated black children in local segregated schools and in their spare time, 
got involved in the early civil rights movement of the 20th century. The superintendent of the school district warned Harry to halt his political activities. When Harry did not, the district declined to renew both of the Moore's contracts, leaving them unemployed after more than 20 years of teaching. A Department of Justice memo on the case noted that this tactic was commonly used to silence and, and intimidate activists at the time. But Moore was undeterred. He went on to become the NAACP's first full-time executive secretary in, in Florida. Then on Christmas Day in 1951, the couple had retired to their bedroom after celebrating the, the holiday, which also happened to be their 25th wedding anniversary. That evening, a bomb exploded under their home. Harry died that night, and Harriet died nine days later. And then Joseph Hill Dumas. Joseph was helping his family move into a new home when he was shot in the back by a white constable in Cary, Florida. He was only 19 years old. Within weeks of his death, a local grand jury was assembled and declined to indict the constable. The NAACP then brought the matter to the FBI, which opened a federal case and obtained statements from some, but not all, of the witnesses. A federal grand jury indicted the constable for violations of civil rights, after which the governor of Florida suspended the constable from duty. The case went to trial, and the constable testified on his own behalf. The federal jury found him not guilty. And last, there's Claude Neal, maybe one of the oldest cases on the entire list. In 1934, Claude Neal was arrested for the murder of his white employer's daughter, who had been found dead near a family farm. According to the DOJ memo, the sheriff became aware of the lynching spirit arising in the community and transferred Neal to one jail after another, eventually sending him across state lines to a jail in Bruton, Alabama. After law enforcement made several trips to the jail to question Neal, the 23-year-old, who couldn't read or write, signed a typed confession signed a type confession letter with an X. Six days after Neil had been transferred to the Bruton Jail, a group of men stormed the facility. They brought Neil's body back to Jackson County, Florida, tortured him for several hours, then murdered him, after which they tied his body to the back of a car and dragged him, eventually hanging him from a tree outside a local courthouse. According to an NAACP investigation, a mob of thousands participated in or watched Neil's lynching. Kill that. All of these cases have been closed by the Justice Department for various reasons. Dead suspects, federal statute of limitations expiring, insufficient evidence, or in the case of Claude Neal, both the state of the evidence and the age of the case. Such results have dimmed the hopes of many families. I'm going to play a montage of some of the uh, family oral history. It's not shocking that they reached the determination that they did, but it's unclear what they did to reach that determination. It's unclear what they could have possibly looked at to reach that determination. From what I understand and what they told me, uh, it was just a, a open and shut and closed case because no one was still living. When I got that call, oh my goodness, I, I, I was on top of the world. And I was saying to myself, oh my goodness, my brother is not forgotten. I came home one afternoon from work and there was a business card stuck in the door. It was from the FBI. And um, I called that number and the person that I spoke to stated that they uh, wanted to inform me that Freddie case was closed. There won't be any way that they can investigate anybody because they were too old. Uh, there was nobody still alive, but that was not true. For some, all that's left is fighting to correct the official account of their loved one's death. Fixing the narrative is the only option left for someone like Cordero Garcia. I spent several hours talking to Cordero about his father, Roman, and the impact his killing had on, on Cordero and his family. Cordero was only five years old when he lost his father in 1962. 
He can only remember flashes of the day Roman was laid to rest. The color guard, the 16-gun salute. At the time of his death, Wentworth Jr. was an Army corporal stationed in Maryland. Meanwhile, his wife Melva and their children remained in their hometown of Taylorsville, Mississippi. At the time, Melva was pregnant with their sixth child, but something was wrong. Roman received notice that she needed an emergency C-section. So he hurried to be by her side, taking a bus to make the thousand mile journey back home. His bus pulled into the station in Taylorsville on the night of April 9th. Witnesses say Roman had fallen asleep and the driver was unable to wake him after the bus stopped. So the driver called the police. Local Taylorsville officer William Kelly arrived. According to a Justice Department memo, at least one witness reported that Kelly boarded the bus and woke Ducksworth by slapping him in the face then escorted him off the bus. Accounts of what happened next vary, but according to some witnesses and but some witness statements, Ducksworth struck Kelly, who responded by hitting Ducksworth on the head repeatedly with his police club. Other statements said Ducksworth merely defended himself against Kelly. By all accounts, Kelly ultimately fired one shot at the ground and a fatal shot into Roman Ducksworth's chest. He died at the scene, 27 years old. His wife, Melva, gave birth that same day. Days after the shooting, a local grand jury declined to, to indict William Kelly, who claimed he acted in self-defense. No charges were filed. But the investigation in, into the shooting did not stop there. The NAACP, led by its Mississippi Field Secretary, Medgar Evers, the FBI, and the Department of Defense, all conducted investigations at the time of the killing. But none of those inv investigations led to charges against Kelly. In the military police report, there were some witness statements that corroborated Kelly's version of events. How statements said that Ducksworth did not attack Kelly, but rather defended himself. By the time the FBI looked into the case again in 2008, it learned that William Kelly had died four years previously. Another, another former Taylorsville police officer who reportedly witnessed the killing had also since died. So the Justice Department concluded the case could not be prosecuted because of this and that the relevant statute of limitations had run out. Soon after, Melva Ducksworth received a letter from the Justice Department and FBI outlining all of this. It's called a next of kin letter. Most of the letters range from two to five pages and are hand delivered by the FBI and DOJ to next of kin once a case is closed. The intent of the letters is to help bring about closure for families. But according to Cordero Ducksworth, it was like, it was like 1962 all over again for his mother. And just three weeks after receiving her letter, Melva Ducksworth passed away. It's still unclear whether any of the pa other passengers on the bus who gave witness statements were still alive when the federal government reinvestigated Roman's killing. There's no mention of them in the DOJ's memo, and an FBI agent who oversaw the Civil Rights Code Cases, Cold Cases Unit at the time told me that she couldn't recall, a, recall if FBI agents made an effort to track any of them down. When I asked the FBI for all files that mentioned Officer William Kelly, I noticed one page from 2009 where the special agent assigned to the case lists the groups and agencies they plan to contact. There was the NAACP, the Taylorsville Police Department, county and state courts for, for potential records. One agency, though, isn't listed, the, Depar the Department of Defense, who had written its own military police report on the killing. In addition to that, one of my reporting colleagues, Ben Greenberg, made another discovery, another witness who wasn't on the bus with Roman, but was certainly alive when the FBI looked into the case again. And Ben, and ben found that the Bureau did not contact this witness between 2008 and 2010, or back in 1962. Who was this witness? A cousin of Roman Ducksworth. This cousin was driving to the bus station to pick up Roman when the shooting happened. When he got there, Roman was already on the ground, struggling to say his last words. When we brought these findings to the FBI and its current chief of the Civil Rights Unit, he told us the D Ducksworth case was thoroughly investigated, but it came down to the fact that they didn't have anyone to prosecute. I complete, quote, I completely understand and appreciate and would love to give the family as much closure as possible, he said. 
But this is just one of those cases that we did have to close. In reports to Congress mandated by the Till Act, the DOJ says that where they can't bring prosecution, they seek to, quote, provide transparency to family members of the victims and truthful accounts of what happened to the greater public. But Cordero Duckworth feels the FBI and Justice Department did not deliver on that promise. That was Cordero Duckworth. If they had came and talked talk to me, and I would have probably tried to get my mother to open up more in trying to find these people that we needed to get information from to help get this thing settled. But they, they didn't try. They didn't try to contact anybody. And that's the sad part. It's like people just want this to go away. People just want this to be left in the, in the dark. They just want us to close our eyes and move on. That frustrates. What he still wants is getting to the bottom of that finding of his father's killing being justified. Many believe that was part of the intent of the Till Act and federal government's cold case initiative. Correct the record, present the truth, even when arrest and prosecution were not possible. But at the FBI and Justice Department, not everyone agreed. Here's uh, FBI former chief of the cold case units, Cynthia Dieter. the pushback that I often got was, look, I, there's nothing that's going to come of this cold case. So there was one school of thought that there were other cases that needed attention today. That's Cynthia Deedle, a former FBI special agent who led... At least on paper, the federal government had the money to do more. When first adopted, the Till Act authorized $13.5 million each year for the FBI and Justice Department. When first out of that, $2 million was supposed to be set aside for state and local law enforcement. But year after year in its, report to Cong in its reports to Congress, the DOJ said that in fact no funding has been appropriated for grants under the Till Act, and the department has received no applications for grants from state or local law enforcement. When we tried to get to the bottom of why this money wasn't being spent, it sadly boiled down to finger pointing. The Justice Department pointing the finger at Congress for apparently not giving them the money, while one member of Congress we talked to pointed back at the DOJ and claimed in their words that Congress gave them the tools, but the DOJ might not have been as focused on pinpointing those dollars. Meanwhile, the clock, the clock kept ticking, and the race for justice grew harder and unlikely for many families. And those were just the cases that made the list. Some institutions, like Syracuse University's Cold Case Justice Initiative, believe the government's list was incomplete. Students and the team at Syracuse have been researching and investigating cold cases since 2007. They had pulled together nearly 200 cold cases that they argued should have been on the government's list, but none of them were. And when they analyzed the cases that the government did add to its list and eventually closed, they found that what were meant to be full reinvestigations were often nothing more than paper reviews. On top of that, my colleagues and I did reviews of cases closing memos and found errors in nearly 20 cases. Incorrect death dates, incorrect locations, incorrect ages. Even for some victims, names misspelled or misrepresented. Many of those errors can be traced back to documents that were given to the DOJ when cases were referred. I mentioned earlier about there being one successful prosecution since the Till Act became law. You might not wonder how it even happened given all I've said up to this point. The honest answer is luck and a very persistent local prosecutor. The killing of Jimmy Lee Jackson is one of the more well-known cases from the civil rights movement, usually noted for helping to inspire the Selma to Montgomery marches for voting rights. The first martyr of the voting rights movement, some at the time of his death, he was a 26-year-old hospital orderly from Marion, Alabama, a deacon in his church. When I talked to his younger sister, Emma Jean, one of the first memories she shared was of him teaching her how to drive using his truck. Both were among a group of young people in their town active in the local civil rights movement. It's what brought them out the night of February 18, 1965. 
A local activist had been jailed for enlisting students to participate in voting rights drives. Fearing he could be lynched, hundreds gathered that night to march in his support. <coughs> Jimmy Lee, Emma Jean, their mother and grandfather joined them. The marchers were met by what the DOJ called a wall of police officers and state troopers who ordered them to disperse, then began beating them with nightsticks in, in a melee. Emma Jean lost track of her brother, mother, and grandfather. The three sought refuge in a cafe. The state troopers followed. Accounts of what exactly happened vary, but by the end, one of the state troopers had shot Jimmy Lee in the stomach. The trooper said that Jimmy Lee had struck him in the hand, and that's what caused his gun to discharge. At least one other witness confirmed most of the trooper's story. But when the FBI interviewed Jimmy Lee afterwards, while still alive in the hospital, he told them the troopers had beaten him inside the cafe, and several witnesses corroborated his account. Eight days after his shooting, Jimmy Lee died in the hospital of an infection caused by his gunshot wound. Seven months after the shooting, a local grand jury in Perry County, Alabama, opted not to indict the, the trooper. The trooper who shot Jimmy Lee was never, was never fully named publicly. That is, until nearly 40 years later in 2004. A newspaper reporter, John Fleming, tracked down the trooper, and somehow he convinced him to agree to an interview. interview. The trooper, James Bonnard Fowler, admitted to shooting Jimmy Lee and claimed it was in self-defense. Imogene brushed it off as a lie. She didn't expect anything to come of the new admission. What do you do, she said to me. You just wait, hope, and pray. Hope arrived by way of a local prosecutor in Alabama who also read the interview, Michael W. Jackson. The second black district attorney to ever be elected in Alabama, Jackson, who's not related to Jimmy Lee and Emma Jean, grew up being very familiar with Jimmy Lee's story and his connection to Selma. Since Marion fell under his jurisdiction, he decided to open an investigation. Jackson did what many hoped the federal government would do with all of the cases, on the ground work posting up at the corner of the courthouse in Marion, looking for people who might be able to point him in the right direction. By the time he was able to bring a case to a grand jury several years later, the federal government had begun its first iteration of its cold case initiative. They assisted Jackson with archival documents and photos, but he said that was the extent of their help. The case dragged on until 2010, when the 77-year-old Fowler pled guilty to manslaughter and received a six-month sentence. He died a free man in 2015. Other cold cases landed on Jackson's desk, including another shooting of a black man at the hands of Fowler. But that case was in a different county out of his jurisdiction. It ultimately landed on the Till Act's list, but was closed in 2011. The DOJ concluded there was insufficient evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Fowler was guilty of a criminal civil rights violation. For the other cases in his district, Jackson once again turned to the Justice Department for help, but this time with a very bold request. He sent a letter to then U.S. Attorney General, Gen then US Attorney General Eric Holder asking for $1 million, but he said he was told there were no funds available for, for the Till Act. To the federal government, the Fowler conviction is a victory for the Act, proof that justice can still be delivered as long as it might take. Emma Jean Jackson, though, she didn't see it that way. Audio of Emma Jean. That's a case of success for the FBI. Uh, maybe it's a success because they arrested somebody, but as far as the time that was given that person for killing another person, and I guess that's that's my thing. Maybe they're calling it one kind of success, and I'm calling it not a success for the family. Image. There have been no other convictions, you might ask, if anything at all ch changed with the Till Act. Has Congress or the Justice, Justice Department tried to make it better? The answer is they have. The act was reauthorized in 2016 with changes to a series of criticisms brought by families and institutions like Syracuse's cold case justice initiative. The time frame of cold cases that could be added to the list was, was extended by 10 years from 1969 to 1979. 
And in just the last few years, grant money has started to go out to local governments to help with their own initiatives. Maryland received funds for its lyn Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, an effort to expand the documenta documentation and, and public understanding of more than 40 known cases of radical lynchings in the state. Washington State is using funds to research, identify, and create an inventory of cold cases involving indig indigenous victims of civil rights violations prior to 1980. The city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and its police department is pursuing forensic genetic, genetic genealogy identification for potential victims of the 1921 Tulsa race massacre. And while Michael W. Jackson didn't receive the funds he asked for years ago, another Alabama district attorney will. In Jefferson County, Alabama, its district attorney was awarded nearly half a million dollars to create a dedicated civil rights cold case crimes unit in its office. Yet with this progress, the greatest foe of any cold case, time, persists. And every case is a race against it. Almost three years have passed since we released Unresolved. I find myself coming back to a question I posed early on in the series. What is this history and effort and our ability or inability, inability to reckon with it mean for how or whether we can move forward as a country? And if we can't do this at home, what does that say about us and the rest of the world? In those nearly three years, hate crimes have been on the rise, reaching record levels last year. According to the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism, Four of the top 10 largest cities in America all broke hate crime records dating back to the 1990s. Police killings have steadily increased year after year. Research from the Mapping Police Violence Project found that 2023 was the deadliest year for police killings, with there only being 14 days without a police killing last year on average. Black people are still three times more likely than white people to be killed by police. And according to PEN America, between July 2021 and June 2023, its research is said to have recorded 5,894 instances of book bans across 41 states and 247 public school districts, with Florida and Texas leading the country in the number of bans. Among the books banned are works that, like Unresolved, attempt to bring the truth of our past to light. Works like the 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones and Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. And according to the National Conference of State Legislatures, more than 20 states have introduced legislation to limit the teaching of divisive concepts in public schools and, and or higher education. The thought of unresolved education curriculum or the curriculum about Chicago's police torture scandal that students in Chicago are now being taught, falling under such a label breaks my heart. Last but not least, there's the state of journalism in America. And I'll be real with you. It's, it's a scary time for us. Thousands of jobs lost. Local journalism, our backbone in crisis. The Medill School State of Local News Study found that more than 200 counties in the U.S. are now news deserts. Another 228 counties are at high risk of losing local news. These are sobering numbers to think about in any context. But with unresolved and civil rights era cases, the ones that have seen an arrest or prosecution, mostly are the result in large part of the work of local journalists. Journalists like Jerry Mitchell, working at the Clarion Ledger in Jackson, Mississippi. Stanley Nelson at the Concordia Sentinel in Faraday, Louisiana. And that interview with Alabama, with Alabama, with the Alabama State Trooper, Daniel Bonnie Fowler, held at a local paper, the Aniston Star. And the reporting on the Chicago police torture scandal I talked about in the beginning, that was at a local alt-weekly, the Chicago Reader and a reporter named John Conway. Every community deserves a strong working local press. Every community, every community deserves to have its stories told, to unearth those hard, uncomfortable truths, because history surrounds us everywhere, from the south side of Chicago to right here in Melbourne. And I'll leave you with this. Just seven miles from where we are is an intersection, Legendary Lane in King Terrace. Almost 100 years ago, in 1926, a black man was lynched there. His name was James Clark. It's a case whose details are eerily similar to another case I talked about earlier, that of Claude Neal. 
During this part of the century, there were more cases of lynching per capita in Florida than in any, of, any other state. James Clark was arrested for attacking a white girl. But soon after, he was taken by a mob and murdered. No attempt was ever made to arrest his killers, and a photograph of his lynching was turned into a postcard. Later, for decades, that street was called Lynching Tree Drive. It wasn't until 1980, three years before I was born, that the name was changed to Legendary Lane. As distant as so much of this history feels, we're not that far removed from it. That is why we must never forget, never be afraid to shine a light. And in the words of the person who shepherded the Till Act from a bill to a law, the late congressman and civil rights leader John Lewis, if we're going to have peace, if we're going to have healing, if we're going to move closer and closer to that sense of community, we must tell the whole story. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. Brittany, you want to come up? We'll, um, we'll have a, I've, we've got a couple of questions for James, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions for the rest of you guys. I, I'm, um, I've been doing this for 13 years, and I still make mistakes. I didn't even introduce myself. My name is Ted Peterson. I'm an associate professor of communication, uh, and I'm the director of student media. And this is Courtney Capper. She is a multi-platform journalism major and the editor-in-chief of the Crimson, the student newspaper. So. Okay, so my first question is, how did the Till Act come about, and who was Alvin Sykes, and what role did the late Representative John Lewis play? Well, yeah, the idea of the Till Act started with a man named Alvin Sykes, um, and it's just one of the most incredible stories you hear. Like, Alvin uh, you know, dropped out of high school, um, born to a teen mom, um, suffered abuse as a child, and after he dropped out, he decided to educate himself at his local library. And years later, uh, he's from Kansas City, um, one of his friends, a jazz musician named Steve Harvey, was murdered by a white man. And uh, charges, at least local charges were not filed against him. So Alvin basically schooled himself on federal law and convinced the Justice Department to bring a federal case against this man and a convic conviction eventually. And from there, he learned that um, his friend Steve Harvey's widow was a relative of Emmett Till. And she connected him to Emmett Till's mother, Mamie Till Mobley. And he worked for, with, with Mamie Till Mobley for years until her death to get Emmett's case reopened. And in doing this work and working on other cases, he came up with this idea for the federal law that would eventually become the Till Act. And he uh, lobbied his state senator in Missouri. And you know, the Till Act was first introduced you know, like around 2004, 2005. Um, but it didn't gain any traction. And by 2006, 2007, uh, John Lewis sort of took the reins of it. And sort of that's when, um, you know, it eventually was passed through Congress. Um, but, you know, we talked to a uh, former staffer of John Lewis's, and, you know, they said that, you know, for John Lewis, the, the Till Act was a compromise, but it was sort of the only compromise that could pass Congress. Um, you know, she said what John Lewis, what he really wanted, he wanted a Truth and Reconciliation Commission similar to what uh, they have in South Africa. But he knew that was never going to be politically viable. And so the best that they could do was the Till Act. Thanks. Um, so a lot of the reporting for this was in the summer of 2020. And um, you think of George Floyd, you think of Breonna Taylor, COVID, yes. um, and went all the way through January 6th. So what was it like to work on this topic during, during those uh, interesting, crazy times? No, it, was, um, it was just a constant reminder of just the relevancy of these stories, um, especially just the fact that you know, a third of the cases on this list were police shootings. And really, the only big difference between a lot of these cases and the cases we've seen in the last decade is you know, cell phones and social media and sort of its visibility. Um, you know, I can remember early on, you know, the, when the news of the Breonna Taylor shooting broke out and sending a link to you know, colleagues in Slack that, hey, we might need to uh, keep an eye on this. Um, and also that um, John Lewis died during the summer of 2020 while we were making this. Um, 
and then later on there was um, a protest in Louisville uh, for the Breonna Taylor shooting. And we'll never forget this photograph. It's like a, it's at night and it's a police bear, bear cat and the crowd and officers all around. And hovering above them was this poster on the side of a building. And it was a poster of one of the people on the list, Alberta Jones, who was the first woman to become a prosecutor in Louisville, who recently had this poster um, in her honor uh, for, from the city. Uh, so just everywhere we turned, it was just a reminder of just like how relevant this history was. And then on January 6th, um, remember it was myself, my producers and editor, we were all you know, sort of in our weekly meeting together and all of us were just like looking at our TVs or our other monitors throughout the whole Zoom meeting. And we had an interview scheduled with uh, Deborah Watts, who is a cousin of Emmett Till's. And she was just so overwhelmed by what she was seeing that she couldn't go forward with the interview. But we talked to her for a little bit that night and she was ready to fly to Washington DC that night because she just didn't know what to do. And she said, you know, her daughters had to like talk her down from just like getting on a plane, you know, that same day. And it just drove home um, just, you know, just the need for why, you know, she wants justice for Emmett is the same reason why she wanted to get on that plane and why Alvin Sykes, you know, did the work that he did, you know, as difficult as it was, as hard as the odds were, because a, a friend of Alvin's told me he still believed in the glimmer of hope of America and what it could be. And then can you think of anything you know now that you wish you had learned in college? Uh, <laughs> uh, taking the extra quarters at Cambodia was a little bit more of a student loan, which we all can relate to. <laughs> um, but one thing is um, just your job, your career not being you know, as much as I love journalism, it's not all that I know. And I think especially as a young journalist, you know, it's easy just to be consumed to work like those 12, 14, 16 hour days and it's like all you do, you wake up and you just sort of have that mindset of looking for the story or talking to a potential source. But you learn that no, it's not your, not your idea, you're more than that, you have family, have a life. So I think that's the thing I wish I maybe had learned early on kind of going into journalism. That's um, probably pretty good advice for any college student in any field, I, I, I would say. Thank you for that. Well, let's let's open it up. James, I'll just let you kind of point to the people who raise their hand rather than yep. me calling on them. So if, if anybody's got any questions for James. Like with the interviews or just the it's the bibliographs and stuff that I did. Mm -hmm. Like I know that this is the Jones members of yeah. the Palmer section, <coughs> but what if you put something in there that someone is listening to and they're like, Oh, well that was in nineteen fifty six. Yeah, no, it's it's tricky. Um and especially with this project because you know, I started working on this project in 2020, so a lot of it was done in isolation. You know, the interviews, you know, my narration tracking, 98% of it was done in my bedroom closet. And that was a worry going into it was just, one, just, you know, how am I gonna relate to these people who are hundreds of thousands of miles away? And that's, I think, the beauty of podcasting is, you know, you don't sort of have, you're not just going for sort of the sound bite like you might, you know, in, um, a daily news story or you know just a one minute story like you have sort of that room to kind of breathe 
and just kind of talk and get to know the person. Um, you know, just one way I would set up interviews is like I wouldn't just go straight to, you know, tell me about, you know, the night they were killed and what happened. Like, I want to, you know, get to know this person. You know, what's their life like? You know, what does this person mean to them? Um, you know, Cordero Duckworth, I remember that was, a, uh, that was actually the one I didn't do in my closet because my Wi-Fi went out. I had to r rush to, you know, Frontline's office and just find the first office, you know, I could. And from there, we talked for almost four hours, you know, that Sunday. And it was just from his childhood to his life, you know, after his camp, you know, saying left Mississippi and moved to Illinois. Um, so I think it just, and that's just something I've just done a lot throughout my career was just, you know, treating people with respect and treating sort of their stories with respect. Um, you know, I had the pleasure of working on another project uh, in Chicago called 16 Shots. And that was about the, the police shooting of Laquan McDonald. And, you know, that was another very sensitive topic to where, you know, you had to sort of wa watch the tone and sort of how we were presenting, um, you know, sort of the case and also the lives of the people involved. And that's always just been a central thing, I think, with 16 Shots and also with Unresolved is sort of centering, you know, the lives and not just, um, you know, their deaths. I know you've done like a lot of interviews and stuff, but what would you say has kind of been like your most memorable? Talking to the families, all of the families of Unresolved, um, just from Cordero to talking with Emma Jean Jackson. Um, I mean, I still have sort of a standing inv invitation for Emma Jean to come down to Alabama to visit. So it's just getting to know them. Um, because, you know, especially with a case like Jimmy Lee Jackson, you just know so much sort of from the historical perspective, but not just sort of from that personal angle. So just getting to sort of talk to them just on that level for, for that length is um, one of the really special. I think uh, part of that is sort of the education component. Um, and I saw it, one of the things I really loved about Unresolved was sort of having sort of this education curriculum that's for I think both high school and college students, you know, that sort of teaching this history. And I think that's part of it is that, you know, a lot of this, you know, we weren't taught. Um, so I talked about, you know, growing up in Chicago and, you know, a lot of that history, like the Bird scandal, you know, we just didn't know. But now, years later, that history is starting uh, to be part of the curriculum. So I think that's sort of the, the first step. Um, I know, it, especially with the, um, the, the Birch uh, police station, there was debate about whether to, like, turn that into a memorial. But, you know, one of the victims, you know, he said, like, it's too painful. I can't even walk inside. So it's, I think it's sort of that balance of, sort of either educational or a physical memorial, but I think at least the first step is just sort of educating ourselves about this history. Uh, 
justice is due. And I wonder how you, as a scholar, researcher, writer, reader, keep from feeling these That's, um, yeah, and I think that's, especially, you know, with this type of reporting, just investigative reporting in general, um, I think sort of being uh, conscious of that and sort of knowing just, like, how to sort of step away when you have to and just sort of practicing self-care. Um, and, you know, you know, especially when working on this sort of in COVID, when we're sort of in isolation, you know, sometimes it was just like, if there was a weekend, just like, going for a walk or like, I'm not going to read a case file today. Um, and we kind of went through this, you know, with the 16 Shots project too, because, you know, that went from, you know, sort of a narrative podcast to, you know, we were covering the trial of this police officer daily. And, you know, it can take a toll, but um, at least for me personally, um, just the mission of the work is always, and this was something I, when I uh, had the pleasure of um, interviewing um, the reporter who, I mentioned it, it worked on the uh, the Bird Torture Scandal, John Conroy. And, I mean, his story, but he worked for years um, at the Chicago Reader. Um, I think he was barely making over 30000 a year there. Um, he eventually had gotten laid off, and even after he got let go, was still um, reporting on this, especially once um, Burge went to trial. And I... But just curious, I asked him, you know, as much hardship as you've, as you, as you've gone through with this, you know, getting laid off and, you know, not, and just also for the longest time, you know, he fr published his first story in 1990, and I remember him telling me, you know, it was a 26,000 word story. <laughs> you could do 26,000 word stories for all weeklies. And, you know, he thought after that first story, you know, the major newspapers in the city were going to pick it up. You know, TV stations were going to pick it up, and they never did. But he kept reporting it. And I just asked, like, what kept you going? And he said, you know, if not me, then who? And I think that just always stuck with me with this work, that if I'm not doing this, then who else is going to, or who's going to pick up to, to do this? Or if I can't um, be, uh, show this work like this, then maybe, you know, somebody else doesn't become aware of that work and wants to maybe pick up that mantle. It's, we don't have one without journalism. <laughs> like, um, I mean, I'll just cite Jerry Mitchell as an example. I mean, Jerry Mitchell is a you know, journalism hero for many, including me, and we were lucky to have him as an advisor on Unresolved. And, you know, Jerry Mitchell, you know, his reporting led to reinvestigations into the murder of Medgar Evers, you know, the 16th Street bombings in Birmingham. Um, the murders of, of Cheney Goodman Schwerner in, in, in Mississippi. Um, and, you know, that's local. And, and for him, especially with the, the Cheney Goodman Schwerner story, it started with him see, going to see the movie Mississippi Burning. And from there, just, you know, his uh, <laughs> description of doing investigative reporting is just starting at the edges and working your way to the middle. And I remember I interviewed him for this, and, you know, he talked about, you know, um, looking into uh, – the, uh, the 16th Street bombing case, and just how one year's difference it took it, um, from, you know, if it, was, if, that, if it was another year that went by where uh, that case wasn't investigated and there was no one indicted, then that would have been it, because uh, I think one of the key witnesses, you know, died in between there. Um, and just his persistence, and, you know, he said with, with journalists, you know, journalists sort of cast a wider net that, you know, maybe the FBI and law enforcement won't do. So, you know, one example is, you know, with the 16th Street case and trying to track down, you know, the alibi for one of the bombers, you know, the bombers had said that, 
the Cute was um, at home, you know, the, the night that they were alleged to have planted the bomb. He, he was, you know, at home watching wrestling, but then Jerry tracked down the newspaper TV listings and found, no, there was a different night. So this is just doing just the legwork like that, the attention to detail. Um, you know, that's you know, it's why this work is important. I would, uh, uh, I would point to reporters like Jerry Mitchell, reporters like you know, Stanley Nelson, reporters like my colleague uh, Ben Greenberg, um, who have kind of been doing this work like you know, long before I have. Um, and like you know, they for me have been great examples of being sort of an ally in this work of rec and also recognizing the work that you know the black press had been doing you know as far back as the 40s, 50s, and 60s. I mean, it was. You know, uh, Jet Magazine that first displayed the pictures of MK. You know, so, you know, so for me, you know, sort of how, you know, they have operated and sort of how they have um, sort of um, not sort of um, tried to sort of be sort of the face of it, but as sort of using their work to sort of uplift uh, sort of these families and sort of their quest for justice. Um, as I've been sort of a guiding light for me. Um, I think always would be the first thing I think about is sort of the audience. Like, who is this story for? Who am I telling this story? And like, and then from there, sort of like, what is the, the best or most effective ways to sort of tell this story? And with Unresolved, um, it was interesting. Like, so the idea of Unresolved so even sort of predates uh, sort of my coming to Frontline. Like, Unresolved, I believe, started as either a sort of documentary or just an interactive. And just I think the more you know, they kept digging in, it was like, no, this could, as they just, you know, uh, sort of uncovered stories like Alberta Jones or like Cordero Duckworth, it was like, this could be its own podcast. And so then it was the idea to do a podcast. Um, and there were uh, filmmakers, you know, Frontline has worked with who were, you know, working on a film about uh, another case in Mississippi, and sort of that became sort of part of the project. Um, so it almost, at least with Unresolved, it was sort of organic in nature, but I think initially just the idea was to um, just find a way to document sort of all of these cases. And to do 150 plus cases, you can't, it, it's, it's too big just, I think, for one medium. So I think the approach with this was just spot on. It really is. You, you should all go to that website and, and engage with the interactive stuff. It's, yeah. it's, um, it's submersive. It's quite amazing. Uh, we've got time for one more question. I'm not seeing it yet here. Go. First, start. Um, sort of just start with, um, I think, reading like investigative, reading investigative journalism. You know, following if it's your local news or if it's you know national outlet, 
you know, following them and then from there just seeing, you know, sort of how they sort of did their story, like ProPublica, for, for example, is, you know, a great outlet. And what one thing I really like about them is they also will do explainers of their investigations, mm -hmm. like how, you know, they went about, you know, telling the story. And I wish, you know, more, you know, outlets did that because I think for people who want to do this work, you know, it's very helpful. Um, you know, for me, you know, coming up in Chicago, um, you know, there was an investigative uh, magazine there called the Chicago Reporter, um, where I was, you know, lucky to intern that, you know, did a lot of great work. And that's where I first kind of got the itch of wanting to do investigative reporting and figuring out just how to do this. And then getting to see investigative reporters who looked like me, because I didn't see that, you know, growing up reading, you know, my, the major newspapers in my city. So to see reporters like me doing this work, you know, doing um, extensive uh, Excel spreadsheets or access databases, you know, it was eye-opening. So it's just always sort of starting with what work is going on in your community and just work that appeals to you. And I would say this to, um, you know, younger journalists, uh, you know, when you're sort of figuring out, you know, what you want to do, of not thinking about, you know, where you want to work. Think about the type of work you want to do. And, you know, look at seeing, you know, who's doing that work already. Um, you know, one of the great things I think about right now is, you know, you have uh, journalists, you know, accessible on like LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, you know, when I was in grad school, you know, Twitter was sort of still in, 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 in its uh, infancy. So, you know, there weren't as many journalists who were accessible like that. But now, you know, there are. You can catch journalists who are doing threads of their work and sort of the behind the scenes of like how hard it was or just stuff that they couldn't even fit in, in, into the article. So um, I think, yeah, I'll, yeah, think about yeah, so sort of the, the work you want to do and sort of who's doing that work and yeah, reaching out to them. I will uh, just second that. Um, you know, I heard a podcast that moved me and I thought, I'd like to invite this guy. And I sent him an email, and now we're best friends, right? You know, so uh, so it it truly is. Uh, it's a community that kind of wants to see the young the young journalists uh, get excited about it, and and uh, it's it's always so welcoming. So, well, join me in thanking uh, James again. Thank you. Just uh, real quickly, some acknowledgments uh, and, and announcements. Uh, thank you for the food Provost Rasul uh, provided us with the snacks. Thank you, President Doctors Nicolo and Dr. Nicolo for uh, joining us. Um, Dean McMahon, uh, oh, maybe he snuck out already. Uh, I'm not sure. Oh, there he is. There he is. Thank you. Uh, Associate Dean Edwards. Uh, it's just, it, it means a lot to have the administration uh, participating in, in events like this. So I truly, I truly thank you. Thank you, everybody who, who came. Of course, Gordon, yeah, thanks to Gordon. He knows, uh, he, he knows. Um, this is my favorite part of Free Speech Week, but it's not the end of Free Speech Week. Tomorrow, we've got a panel with some local news journalists that's gonna be in the link room uh, in, in the library. Uh, that'll be at 5.30 as well. And then the Free Food Festival, you get a free meal in exchange for your First Amendment rights. And nobody uses those anyway, right? So, uh, so <laughs> come participate uh, and, uh, and see what the fun is. Thank you again so much, and thank you to James. Thank you.